YouTube apologist Theologica37 is apparently of the opinion that the existence of the good refutes naturalism. There is a response to the naturalistic fallacy and to the Izzat gap. It's just that it would totally undermine naturalism and justify theism. These arguments provide robust deductive falsifications of naturalism, uh, so long as there is goodness. I'm of the opinion that he's wrong. In this video, I demonstrate why. Theologica's opinion rests on the following argument. Where P is a posit in an empirical theory, and G is the good, line 1 defines naturalism, or at least ontological naturalism, as the claim that only those things which science says exist, actually exist. Line 2 is a premise, which says that there is nothing in science that can be identified with the good. Theologica uses an argument by G. E. Moore to support this claim, where Q is the question, is P. G. If I understand that a bachelor is, by definition, an unmarried man, then it would be silly for me to ask someone the question, is a bachelor an unmarried man? Lion 2.1 says that there's no possible situation in which something scientific can be properly identified with the good without it being silly for me to ask whether that scientific thing is the good. In other words, if something scientific had been properly identified with the good, it would be as silly for me to ask whether that thing is the good as it would be for me to ask whether a bachelor is a married man, knowing perfectly well what the definition of bachelor is. Line 2.2 says that it can never be silly for me to ask whether a scientific thing is identical with the good. Line 2.3 says that nothing in science is identical to the good. This makes sense if there's no possible situation in which something scientific can be properly identified with the good without it being silly for me to ask whether that scientific thing is the good, as line 2.1 says, and that it can never be silly for me to ask whether a scientific thing is identical with the good, as line 2.2 says. Indeed, given that there is no possible situation in which line 2.1 and 2.2 are true, whilst 2.3 is false, line 2.3 is the conclusion of a valid argument. Notice that the conclusion reached in 2.3 is identical to line 2 in the main argument. Teleologica also draws on the is or gap to support line 2. That is the difficulty, famously discussed by David Hume, in getting prescriptions which tell us what we ought to do from descriptions which only tell us about the way the world is. Together then it is Moore and Hume who provide the two legs upon which line two of Theologica's argument stands. Being a dutiful theist, he embellishes this with the mystic talk of non-relational, non-quantitative, absolute simplicity and the like, uh, in order perhaps to conflate the good with his conception of God. However, the philosophically substantial reasoning in support of line two remains that of Moore and Hume. Line three of the main argument says that there is no situation in which the good exists whilst naturalism is true. This makes sense, because if the good is not scientific, as line 2 suggests, then the existence of the good would demonstrate, contrary to naturalism as defined in line 1, that non-scientific things exist. Line 4 says that the good exists. Line 5 says that ontological naturalism is false. This makes sense, because if there is no situation in which the good exists whilst naturalism is true, as line 3 says, then given that the good does exist, as line 4 says, naturalism must be false. Indeed, given that it is impossible for all the lines 1 to 4 to be true whilst line 5 is false, line 5 is the conclusion of a valid argument.
Despite its being valid, Theologica's argument is not cogent, which is to suggest that it says something false somewhere between lines 1 and 4. Does it say something false in line 1? Well, whilst I would admit that my metaphysical naturalism would be true if our best empirical theories exhausted existence, I don't agree that it would only be true if our best empirical theories exhaust existence. This proviso should be borne in mind, given a likely reply to the criticism that I shall now make of line 2. The first leg, upon which line 2 stands, is Moore's argument. However, Moore's argument fails because line 2.1 is false. This is because scientific words need not, as features of empirical theories, share the same initial meaning as the things they refer to. The formula H2O, for example, refers to the same thing as the word water, but this couldn't have been established independently of their use in empirical theories. It would thus not be silly, at least not in the same way as line 2.1 proposes, for me to ask, is water H2O? which is to say it would only be silly after I have done and properly understood the science and not beforehand. That science opens up the possibility of these so-called synthetic as opposed to analytic identities also opens up the possibility that something scientific could be the good, whilst questioning it would not, in the relevant sense, be silly. This possibility falsifies line 2.1 and the rest of Moore's argument. Theologica anticipates this well-known criticism by saying that ontological naturalism, as the claim that science exhausts existence, must rest on analytic identity if it is to avoid the mere possibility of the good as something outside of science. Without this analytic reductionism, it is possible that moral facts are transcendent realities, forms of a sort, uh, metaphysical laws perhaps, or uh, irreducible pre-world categories, all of which are blatantly queer given ethical naturalism, and naturalism in general. However, as touched upon with regards to line 1, naturalists need not hold that current science exhausts existence. One can be a naturalist without passing final judgments on the in-principle possibility of the things that don't currently feature in our best science existing. A naturalist could hold the existence of such things as improbable or merely accidental, given the science we have. Thus Theologica's reply uncharitably mischaracterises what naturalists would be prepared to accept in the face of future scientific evidence. And so line 2.1 remains false. The falsehood of Moore's argument takes away the first leg upon which line 2 of Theologica's argument stands. The remaining leg upon which line 2 of Theologica's argument stands is Hume's Isord Gap. A common response to the Isord Gap suggests that the description of what something's job is, its purpose or teleology, can provide a prescription as to what it ought to do. Indeed, Theologica himself admits the usefulness of teleology in bridging the Isord Gap. So what of the teleological functional hypothesis as a means to solve the gap of last consequence? Now this is quite a compelling case. Keech presents it in Good and Evil, and McIntyre briefly in After Virtue. The world given this example is likened to the chessboard. Man is made for specific moves. The moral world operates according to moral rules, according to the plan of the game. And man's value is intrinsic to his essence as a person or as a chess piece. If this final solution to the is gap is a good one, then it does seem to provide us not only a uh, consistent moral hypothesis, but a means of bridging the gap. This is quite a compelling argument. Of course, he adamantly denies that teleology can be naturalized. So the final point is whether this Aristotelian Thomistic natural law theory is accountable uh, and suitable for naturalistic deployment. And it obviously isn't. All of these talks of man uh, having an intrinsic teleological purpose in the teleological nature of the world will not only severely make naturalists uncomfortable, it's incompatible with their presuppositions. However, in its philosophical substance rather than its theological embellishment, this denial rests on Moore's argument, which has been dealt with. Naturalists may therefore be free to peel away the Aquinas from the Aristotle and uh, adopt a teleological, or if they prefer, a teleonomic approach to bridging the Isord gap.
This possibility takes the remaining leg from under line two of Theologica's argument. In no longer having a leg to stand on, and in the absence of any further substantial philosophical support, line two of the argument could well be false. The potential falsehood of line two entails possible situations in which the good exists, whilst naturalism, is, even as it is defined in line one, is true. Therefore, line three is false. I will admit line four. In summary, then, line one of Theologica's argument is potentially misleading, whilst line two is potentially false. It follows, therefore, that line three is definitely false. The appraisal of premises provided in the previous section demonstrate why Theologica's argument that the existence of the good refutes naturalism is not cogent. Therefore, naturalists are at liberty to ignore his conclusion. Thank you for listening. I told you I could do it, didn't I? Uh... <laughs>